And a one, and a two, and a one, two, three. Rhyme us for stop 100 games of all time. Some are good and some are bad and some are lots of fun. Ryan has a PhD, lost his URL certainly. Felt to say, break and you see, so here's his favorite top one. It's Ryan Metzler here again, and today we're going to go through 10 more of my favorite games, counting down from game 70 all the way to game 61. Hopefully you can get, a, get an idea of what I like, and you can see if they're for you based on the reasons I like them. Uh, but before I say any more, why don't we just go ahead and get right straight to number 70. Number 70, Colonia. Game number 70 is one I reviewed fairly recently, and it's a game from Queen Games called Colonia. Now this is a very Euro-y game that's going to play anywhere from three to six players, and the idea here is that you're using workers in order to accomplish the uh, idea of you know, buying relics and donating those relics to the church in order to have them donate a stained glass window to you. Uh, so you're trying to, you know, get influence from your family into the church, uh, and they're going to reward you, and that's the whole concept of the game. But the uh, the way that it plays out is that you have workers and you use those workers to bid on things, to bid for turn order essentially, uh, and then a, even more so to activate various different things out on the board, but you don't get them back immediately at the end of the round. So you have a limited number of family members and you can use them all in one turn, but if you do so, you're not going to have them for later. And so it brings kind of a timing element into the play here that's really unique and kind of interesting, and it's what really makes Colonia good. Um, so it's got that different feel to it as opposed to some other games. Uh, it is, of course, very Euro-y and very deep in terms of gameplay and so it offers you know a nice experience a strategic thinking experience with something that's a little bit new uh, so if that sounds good to you check it out that's my uh, short review of Colonia check out the full review and definitely try the game uh, a little bit underrepresented on board game geek I think there's only my own review in, in terms of video reviews Colonia from Queen Games. number 69 hive For the first time on the list, we have an abstract. Um, that abstract is probably one of the first ones I played, and it's definitely one of the first games I reviewed. That game is Hive, or in this case, Hive Carbon. Uh, now, the awesome part about this game, first off, is that the pieces are just phenomenal. Uh, it's made out of these Bakelite tiles, and on these tiles, you have different insects printed. Here we have the Mosquito expansion that I've got kind of lumped in with the rest of the game. But in this game, uh, players are representing a hive of insects. Each player has several different insect pieces. Uh, and they're trying to maneuver those pieces around to, to surround their opponent's queen bee. On the first player that successfully surrounds the opponent's queen bee using their own pieces or the player's pieces who they're playing against is going to be the winner. Now the interesting part here is that each of these insects has a different movement style. So ants kind of march around, uh, grasshoppers hop over things, uh, beetles can climb on top of other pieces and pin them down. Uh, it's very thematic for a Euro game, but still, or sorry, for a abstract game, but still a very abstracty feeling game. Uh, it's easy to teach to new players, it's definitely uh, very portable, you can see it all fits in this little bag, uh, and it can be played pretty much anywhere, which makes it a great game for having around. You can play it on the beach, you can play it next to the pool, you can play it in your basement, you can play it in the airport, uh, and I've played it a lot of those places. So, uh, with all that said, very portable, very accessible, and of course a very good and highly strategic uh, abstract game that I think a lot of players should check out. That's Hive or Hive Carbon, and it's also available in Hive Pocket. Check it out. Number 68, Reef Encounter. Game number 68 is one that I've had for quite a time as well. Uh, it is a game that has a theme that's not too standard. Uh, it's about building a coral reef, and of course that game is Reef Encounter by Richard Breeze. Now he's been a lot around a lot recently, and you're probably more familiar with his line of key games. Uh, there's Key Cathedral, and there's Key Flower, and Key Harvest, and Key Market, all of which have been fairly well received. This is one that's published by Z-Man Games. It's called Reef Encounter. Uh, and in this game, first off, there's beautiful artwork. There's some very nicely colored coral tiles, uh, but you're going to be collecting polyp cubes and using those polyp cubes to grow coral tiles. The terminology in the rulebook is very poor, but the game is very good. Uh, there's a, the kind of a hidden aspect of what you're currently collecting, and you're going to play those cubes out to the board to try and grow your coral, but you also need to send your parrotfish to eat those coral in order to score points. And of course, eating the right corals and eating the right amount of coral and having the most coral eaten is going to give you points. So 
you're kind of trying to maneuver around there, but there's also an aspect of puzzling other players out of being able to build in certain areas because you can't merge two corals of the same color. So if you kind of build so that they, uh, they can't build, you can lock them out of some point scoring opportunities. And that's where the game really comes in. It's kind of a cutthroat game of coral building, uh, which is something you wouldn't expect from a game themed around you know, growing a peaceful coral. Uh, and so it has a really cool theme with a really interesting mechanic that doesn't really seem like it would mesh with that theme, but kind of does in the end. And you're trying to manage that growth with managing your parrotfish and also managing where your shrimp are at so that you can continue to grow your coral. Uh, so it has a lot of things that you're trying to kind of balance. Uh, you're trying to fight with other players and it really comes together for a great experience. If you want a good theme and a great Euro game, check it out, that is Reef Encounter. Number 67, Pax Porphyriana. The next game on this list is a tableau building game. Now, you're familiar with tableau building games, and this won't be the last tableau building game you see in my top 100, but this is one you probably haven't played. It's called Pax Porphyriana. Uh, it looks like this, it comes in this small little box. And it's by a designer, well, the, the company is Sierra Madre Games. The designer is Phil Eklund. Now, he is uh, responsible for several different games that you may have heard of, like High Frontier or Bios Megafauna. These are giant scientific type games with a lot of history in them. Uh, they're kind of scientifically accurate. Uh, and High Frontier has this huge, gigantic map that you can play it out on. But he's known for including a lot of history and a lot of science into his games. And Pax Porfiriana is no different. Now, this one... Uh, is about Mexico, uh, and basically different types of government, toppling different types of government in Mexico. And the regime will change as the game goes on based on things that the players do. So you may have uh, an anarchy regime, or you may have, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter, but uh, you could have a revolution or whatever the case may be. You're going to be trying to topple the appropriate government or uh, to, you know, outscore your opponent by collecting cards and playing them in your tableau. And each of these cards has different interactions. You have troops that you can send over to your opponent's tableau, or you can keep them on your own tableau to defend your, your leader, you might want to call them, or whatever the case may be. But there's a lot of interaction. It's very deep. Uh, and the first couple times you play through the game, you're not really going to understand what's going on. The rule book is a little bit difficult to piece through, but it's well supported online and there's a living rule book to get you through it. And once you do, the satisfaction of the reward you get from this is very satisfying. Uh, there's a very strategic game in here. There's, uh, you know, multiple different ways to win. Uh, and it, once you figure them out, it's always trying to figure out what your opponent's doing and then adjust accordingly so that they can't win and maybe you can edge out ahead. So if you're looking for a very strategic, very interesting, and of course historically accurate, or mostly historically accurate game, Check it out, that's Pax Porfiriana. People who like things like innovation, glory to Rome, or searching a little bit for something a little bit deeper uh, and more strategic uh, may even want to take this, check this one out. Pax Porfiriana from Sierra Madre Games. Number 66, Rouge. Game number 66 marks the third appearance of my favorite designer and the one that's in my theme song, Stefan Feld. Now this one is a game that has been released in the past year. We're gonna take a look at Bruges here. Uh, Bruges just came out. Uh, it, I think it just released in the United States, not even a couple months ago. It was at Gen Con, but in very limited numbers, uh, by Z-Man Games. My copy is the Hans im Gluck game, uh, not the Z-Man copy, but same game overall. And in this game, each player is going to have cards that they're using for various different actions, be it uh, using that card to make a building, or using that card as a person to go in that building, or simply discarding the card to get some workers. The cards are everything in this game. You will use those cards for every action you take. But the way he manipulates those cards, the way he makes it so that cards can do everything, uh, really focuses the game, makes it easy to learn, makes it easy to play, uh, but gives you a whole host of strategies to use for one card. And you may want to use it for three different things. You have to decide which the best one is for that card, because you can only use it for one of them and then it's gone. Um, so a lot of strategy in a very short game, and a very, I'd say, you know, medium to light game even, when you're looking at felled titles. Uh, so it's a great, you know, 60 minute, hour long game, obviously 60 minutes, uh, that you can plop down, teach to people really fast, uh, and get it to the table and play it and you can learn the strategies. And I think there's several different strategies to be had, so, you know, trying to piece out what those all are, switch them up from game to game, uh, and still use only really one component to accomplish it is a unique feat. So if that sounds good to you, check it out. That's Bruges. I have a review up. Uh, you can see what it looks like, see how it plays, and decide if it's good for you. Number 65, Archipelago. 
The next game on the list is another fairly new game. This time we're talking about Archipelago. Now, Archipelago here is a game uh, that has just recently been released. It's been out for a little while now, but uh, it's still a newer game within the last year or so. Uh, and this is a game, of course, about settling on an archipelago. Uh, each player is going to be an explorer that's trying to settle this land, but the land is inhabited by natives. Uh, and so you have to kind of carefully balance the settling of this land uh, with the appeasing of the natives and just make sure that they don't go into revolt. Now, each player kind of has to work together to make this happen, because if you all, you know, abuse the system, uh, then it's not going to turn out well for you. But if you work together at the same time trying to outmaneuver one another, uh, you're going to prosper, hopefully, but one player wants to prosper the most. Uh, so you're going to kind of, you know, manipulate the system to try and keep it in balance. But each, there's several different tracks in this game, and each track has an influence on the other tracks. So you need to carefully balance where these tracks are at in order to make sure they don't go over the top in order to incite and revolt, uh, all at the same time trying to accomplish your secret objective, which is worth victory points at the end of the game. So each player will have an objective that kind of is their main focus. They'll provide them with bonus points at the end of the game, and everybody's going to score for these bonuses at the end of the game. So kind of trying to best piece out what everybody else has with what you're trying to do is going to be an important aspect. Uh, I don't really have too much more to say about the game other than that it's a very interesting Euro that you can play at medium or, or even short uh, or very long length. It has a scalable uh, rule book that tells you how to scale your game for a shorter game, a medium game, or a longer game so that you can adapt the game to your own time frame, uh, dependent on how much time you have or what kind of player you're playing with. So it's very uh, malleable, very adjustable for various different types of players or playing scenarios. Uh, and one I suggest you check out because it has some interesting mechanics. That is Archipelago. Number 64, a few acres of snow. This game is a two-player game, A Few Acres of Snow. Uh, it's a Martin Wallace game published by Tree Frog Games, and one that had a lot of controversy over it for quite some time, and that's because there was a strategy that was found, uh, or believed to be completely broken. It's called the Halifax Hammer. And it was a strategy where if one player took a certain set of moves in an exact order, they should be guaranteed to win the game, as long as you know everything fell to their... To their um, benefit, but uh, there was really supposedly very little way to counter it. Uh, so a lot of people will claim this game is broken. I don't care about that. It doesn't matter to me if the game is broken or not, because there's one way to avoid that brokenness, and it's simply to just not play that strategy. Uh, now, I reviewed this game pretty early on. The review is up. Uh, but this is a two-player game in which each player has a starting deck of cards. Uh, one player will represent the French, uh, and the other player will represent the British. Uh, and in this game, you're kind of, you know, settling Canada. So you're talking about the settlement of an area of Canada, uh, and you're going to be fighting between the two, you know, groups to try and settle that area. So one player will start on one side and the other on the other side, and you're going to have this deck of cards that's largely similar at the start. You need to use those cards for traveling and for selling various areas, for trading to get more money, whatever the case may be. Maybe. But over the game, you can buy more cards to add them to your deck. So it's got a little bit of a deck builder aspect in it. And so you're going to be buying cards to add to your deck, maybe building up for more war, or you're going to build up more trading so you can get more money. Um, all to try and settle various places to get victory points. And there are end game conditions where if one player manages to get all the way over to the other player's side and settle their area, they win the game. Or, you know, vice versa, if the other player comes all the way over to the other player's side and settles the area, they can win the game. Uh, but the game can also go to an end point where you're just trying to collect victory points, either by uh, raiding other people's villages uh, and, you know, collecting points that way or settling various points on the board. And it can end in a situation where essentially uh, you just count up points at the end of the game. So, through, you know, kind of strategizing, getting money and buying more cards to add to your deck, you can try in different strategies, be it settling or getting money or whatever the case may be, in order to win the game. And I think that's what makes this an interesting one. Now, if you go online and you read all of the strategies, it's not going to be as fun. But if you play the game for yourself, try and discover what the dominant strategies are, try and best outwit your opponent, I think you'll have fun with it. That is A Few Acres of Snow by Martin Wallace. Number 63, Innovation. This game on my list is one I actually mentioned earlier in my video when I was talking about Tableau games. We saw Pax Porphyriana, now we're going to talk about Innovation by Osmati Games. Now this is a game in which players are working to try and uh, gather or create inventions. They're going to meld inventions to the table in front of them into their own Tableau. And these inventions will, inventions will give them abilities, uh, which you can activate. They're called Dogma abilities, and those will sometimes affect the own player's board allowing them to draw new cards into their hand, or to play more cards, or simply to score cards uh, into their scoring area. And scoring those cards is actually not how you win the game directly. 
you need to have a certain amount of points, but having those points is what's going to allow you to achieve. And achievements are pre-set out cards that are going to let you essentially get one point towards winning the game at a point when you have enough points to get it. So you'll gain and lose victory points, uh, which are really you know, just a currency to be used to buy achievements, which are the real uh, currency of winning the game. Um, so a strategy is to you know, prevent your opponent from having those and they can't achieve. But there are other ways to win the game. There are special achievements that you can get or just you know, straight up victory conditions that come on some of the cards. So if your opponent's limiting you from winning by getting the achievements, uh, you can go ahead and try, and try for an alternate victory strategy, or you can steal all of their points from them and get them into your own tableau area so that you can get those achievements. Uh, but getting a certain set amount of achievements is going to be the way it goes. However, some of these abilities that come out on the invention cards are very strong. Some of them directly target your opponents. Uh, and as I said, some of them are just, you know, the game ends now uh, and you win if you've accomplished this scenario. Or if your opponent has accomplished the scenario, they win. Uh, so it's kind of a swingy game, but one that has a lot of fun to that swinginess. And once you've played it a lot, you're going to see the strategies that come out in it. You're going to be able to try and plan for those swings and hope that one of them comes out in your favor. Um, that's really all I can say about it. There's several expansions to this game that alter the game state. I haven't actually played the most recent expansion yet, so I can't talk about it. Uh, but the expansions do improve upon or change the game, offer some new things to it, uh, and, you know, keep it a little bit fresh for you. So uh, check it out. That is Innovation, my second, or, well, the second Tableau game you've seen, but not the last one that you'll see in this, you know, total scenario. Number 62, Mage Knight. Next up on the list, we have a game that initially appears to be a uh, American style of game, very thematic. We have Mage Knight. You look at it and you're like, woo, fantasy. There's this, you know, giant warrior on the front with a sword and there's dragons behind him and everything looks very exciting. Uh, and it does have that awesome fantasy theme. And that's part of the reason it made this list. The other reason is that behind this awesome you know, fantasy strategy, you have a little bit of Euro going on. This game has a deck building aspect uh, that's going to be very Euro-y in its feel. Of course, it's still a card game at heart, but it's played out on a board with minis, uh, and you're doing combat with those cards. Uh, kind of Thunderstone-esque when you think about it, uh, but with miniatures and a modular board and other players that you can interact with out on that board. Uh, so in this game, each player is their own little mage knight, uh, and they're going to be moving around a board fighting enemies or uh, you know, going to different wizard towers and destroying that tower, eventually trying to capture cities, uh, which are fortified areas with lots of enemies in them. Uh, and in doing this, you're going to collect essentially experience, uh, now they don't really call it experience, but you'll get some experience and you'll eventually level up, making your character better. You'll get more abilities. Uh, you'll get you know, your own little kind of peons to come with you and help you in your fights. Uh, you'll get spells that you can cast and you'll all the while be collecting different types of resources, be they uh, crystals to cast things or tokens which are less permanent than crystals that you will use to cast your spells and activate abilities on your cards. So you'll start out with a deck of cards and slowly but surely you'll build those cards up by slaying enemies uh, and going into town and buying things. Now, in addition to all of that, uh, there's some scenarios where you can, you know, fight with other players. There'll be player versus player combat and you can go into somebody else's space and try and attack them to drive them out. And um, that's worth, you know, some points as well. So. There's all kinds of ways to get points. It takes epic fantasy and it merges it with deck building uh, in order to create a Euro-y fantasy American style mixture of game that's really quite fun. Uh, it's a Vlad Chivadal game. He also, also writes very good rule books. Uh, it can be played solo uh, and it has an expansion out that you can use to keep the game fresh again. So I'm always about trying to keep my games uh, n you know, new and fresh and exciting for me. Uh, this is a game that manages to do that through the offering of various different scenarios and of course an expansion. If that sounds good to you, you check it out. That is Mage Knight from WizKids. Number 61, Moo. And the final game in this video is one that's a trick taker. I actually don't have the box to show you because I don't know where it's at right now. I can't find it. Uh, but Moo is a trick-taking game in which you're going to have pairs, uh, you're going to have teams. Uh, and in the game, you're going to have a starting bidding round at the beginning, bidding how many trick or cards you're willing to play out of your hand. Uh, that's a very confusing game to explain, so I'm going to keep it to a minimum. But you're going to bid cards out of your hand that other players will be able to see. Uh, when you're doing this, you're going to bid around the table, and however many cards you bid is going to dictate how many tricks or how many points and tricks you must take. Now, when you've done that, you're going to basically uh, win the trick or nobody's going to win and it's going to null out the whole trick, but there's, there's all kinds of crazy rules about how this bidding works. When you're done with the bidding, 
Uh, the the leader is going to get to choose a partner, and that partner is going to be their partner for that trick. And the other players are going to form a team that's going to try and stop the leader and the other player from achieving their goal of however many points they need. Uh, there will also be trump suits that are called, but essentially it's a bidding and then trick taking game where if the leader and his partner do not take the appropriate amount of points and tricks, uh, they're going to lose some points. The leader will lose points, whereas the partner is always safe. So being the partner is kind of a good idea, and you'll bid for being in that position as well. Um, whereas the other players are trying to essentially set the team of the leader and his partner in order to score their points. Uh, and points will be lost based on the difference between how many you bid and how many you got. Uh, and then points are scored based on other things, based on what the uh, trump is that you choose. Uh, and different types of trumps are worth more or less points based on uh, how common the cards are that you chose. Uh, so there's a lot going on. It's a crazy uh, bidding game uh, with a lot of trick taking going on, some partnership uh, play, and it's very interesting. If you're into trick taking games and you're looking for something that's outside of the norm uh, with a lot of strategy, especially in the bidding, check this one out. That is Moo. You've seen games 70 through 61, a little bit of trick taking, uh, some American Euro combos, and a lot of deck building, uh, but hopefully a good mixture of games. Later this week, you'll see yet another video, and then next week, we'll get into the top 50 games, my absolute favorites, the top 50%. Check it out next week.